Hey, good morning, everyone. Tuesday morning. We're back in the Gospel of John. Excited that you can, um, so that you guys, uh, hopefully you guys are having a good day and uh, that things are well in your home and in your faith. And uh, we're going to dive back into chapter 18 of the book of John today as we continue to look at the life of Jesus. I uh, just want to remind you a couple things coming up. We've got uh, tomorrow night, which is Wednesday night, we've got the um, uh, spaghetti dinner and uh, worship night tomorrow night. So come out for a great night of just uh, praise and worship time and uh, good food. And you won't miss, don't want, don't want to miss that. It's going to be a great time. Uh, that starts tomorrow night at 6 p.m. here at church. Uh, so please come out and join us for that. Uh, excited about what's going to happen there. Um, also wanted to uh, remind you that we are planning a trip down to South Florida. Um, we're looking at leaving like next Thursday morning, uh, which would be like the 13th of uh, October. Uh, traveling down, working Thursday afternoon, working Friday, working Saturday, working some of Sunday, and then coming home Sunday afternoon. Um, so uh, we're looking at doing that. Love to have you come with us if you're interested in helping with uh, giving aid to the people of South Florida. We're going to be primarily focused in that Port Charlotte area, um, working with a church down there and uh, just going out helping families in the community that have been uh, impacted by the storm. So doing a lot of chainsaw work, doing some possible removing of drywall in people's homes and helping clean up uh, inside their homes so they can start rebuilding things of that nature. So, um, love to have you come and join us. Uh, John chapter 18 though, Jesus, um, has been with the disciples this, this long evening. We talked about this, uh, yesterday, uh, washes their feet, has a last supper, institutes communion, talks about the Holy Spirit, tells, tells them he's leaving this earth, um, prays with them, for them, prays for us, all that kind of stuff. And then they travel out, um, and they're, they're now at the garden. So they've gone across the city of Jerusalem. They're now outside in the garden of Gethsemane. The Bible tells us that a group of people come to arrest Jesus. Now, this is one of these like things that when, when we read this story, it's not like Jesus does any teaching here in terms of like uh, giving a sermon or any of that kind of thing, any of those kind of things. What we find here is just a demonstration of who he is. Um, there's, uh, there's some interesting things that come out of this that I think are worth noting, um, about Jesus, also about Peter, also just about who he, Jesus is in his nature. So let's just read this. I'm going to read chapter 18, starting in verse one. It says, when he had finished praying, Jesus left, uh, sorry, Jesus left with the disciples, crossed the Kidron Valley. On the other side, there was a garden. And he and his disciples went into it. Now Judas, who betrayed Jesus, knew the place because Jesus had often met there. Um, Jesus had often met there with his disciples. So Judas came to the garden, guiding a detachment of soldiers and some officials from the chief priests and the Pharisees. They were carrying torches, lanterns, and weapons. Jesus, knowing all that was going to happen to him went out and asked them, Who is it you want? Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. I am he, Jesus said. And Judas the traitor was standing there with him. When Jesus said, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. He asked them again, Who is it you want? Jesus of Nazareth, they said. And Jesus answered, I told you, I told you that I am he. If you are looking for me, let these men go. This happened so that the words he had spoken would be fulfilled, that I have not lost one of you guys, I'm sorry, that I have not one of those you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's, servants, uh, high priest's servant, cutting off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Peter commanded, uh, Jesus commanded Peter, uh, put your sword away. Shall I not drink uh, the cup the Father has given me? So here's uh, an interesting, a couple of interesting things from this text. First of all, I think it's really worth noting that this was a frequent place they would gather to pray and teach. Um, I think that's a good reminder to us. We should have frequency in our prayers, right? The the garden was Jesus' go play, go to go place when he prayed, 
and met with the disciples when he was in Jerusalem. It's important for us to have a time and a place and a, and a dedicated time that we would spend time with the Father in prayer. That's really important. So it tells us that Jesus was in this garden, and it says that Judas, who betrayed him, right, brought with him this detachment of soldiers. Now, there's a lot of speculation on how many soldiers this was, but most likely, most historians believe this was somewhere in the neighborhood of several hundred men um, to arrest one guy in the middle of the night when everybody else is sleeping. It seems a little bit odd. It's almost like they knew, right? Judas knew. Judas knew how powerful Jesus was. And so he's like, you, be, you better get a bunch of people if you're going to go take this guy down. Let's go get a bunch of people. So it wasn't just the Roman soldiers, but it was a bunch of, uh, I don't know, a bunch of vigilante guys, the, some of these leaders of the Pharisees and the high priests and all that kind of stuff. They all came to arrest Jesus. So they, were, they had weapons. They were carrying torches. I mean, it was just not a good situation. So this wasn't just like, three or four like bounty hunter guys coming to get Jesus. This is an army of people. I mean, hundreds of people that descend down on this garden and Jesus sees them coming. He goes out and meets them. Jesus knows everything, right? He, he knows what's going down. He knows he's getting ready to be arrested. So he asked them, he says, who is it you guys really want? And they said, we want Jesus of Nazareth. Now I think this is important to note because, um, not all those men there would have known Jesus. Some of them did, but not all of them. A lot of the Romans might not have known Jesus. Um, so he says, who is it you want? And they said, uh, we want Jesus of Nazareth. And so Jesus says, that's me. He said, I, I, I am he. That's what Jesus says. He, he acknowledges, I'm the guy you're looking for. But what is so impressive about this, this is such a cool thing. It tells us there in verse 6 that when Jesus answered, I am he, it tells us that every one of those soldiers, every one of those people came that came to arrest Jesus, they were knocked backwards and fell down. And the Greek language there almost was like they had passed out. Um, that in fear and in power, um, they were they were pushed back by the sound of Jesus' voice. Now, the Bible tells us in the book of Revelation that uh, the voice that comes from the throne of God is like, rushing water like thundering noise like how powerful it is um i don't know how jesus did that right i don't know i mean it's hard to we weren't there so it's hard to really know but when he says i am he it is almost like when he speaks like this power emanates from him to the degree that it knocks them all down and then i love jesus statement now i don't know if this is how jesus intended it this is how I read it. Uh, so it says in verse 6, it says, When Jesus said, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Verse 7, again he asked them, Who is it you want? I don't know if it played out like this, but in my mind, this is how I, I envision it playing out. Jesus says, Hey, who, who are you guys here for? They said, Jesus of Nazareth. He says, Well, I'm he. They all fall down in fear. And it's almost like it, Jesus says right after that, like, Are you? Who do, who do you really want? Are you sure you want to take me? You sure you want to do this? Almost like toying with them a little bit. Like, I, I just want you to know, like, you're not in control here. It's almost like Jesus in this moment was just saying and demonstrating to us, like, you think that you guys have the power. Satan, you think you have authority over me. You don't have the power of me. Um, that's why Jesus said in, in his uh, ministry, um, he was talking to this to the, the Pharisees about himself. And he said, um, he said, tear this temple down and I'll rebuild it in three days. Um, demonstrating his, his power over his body. Jesus says, um, uh, no one takes my life. I lay it down. Uh, Jesus says, if I, if I lay it down, I can pick it back up again. And we know he did that, right? He laid his life down for us. Three days later, he rose from the dead. Uh, all that power was within him. And I just love that picture. And I think it's a good reminder to us that we, we should have this reverence for Jesus, this reverence for who God is, this respect and ad admiration um, of, of loyalty to him because he is so powerful, right? He is the one that holds everything together. He's the one that sustains us completely. And, and I think sometimes we lose track of that in our world that we are doer yourselfers. Um, I think it's important that we recognize the power and the majesty and the splendor of just who Jesus is in his power.
So I think that's cool. The other thing I think is interesting and worth noting here is that when all this was taking place, Peter, who normally always gets a bad rap, right? Um, Peter normally, uh, we always accuse Peter of saying the wrong things, right? Jesus said to him one time, get behind me, Satan. Um, Peter denied Jesus at the grave. Uh, I mean, at the, uh, at the trial. We're going to see that tomorrow in the next couple of days. Uh, he gets a bad rap. But, I mean, but Peter, to his defense, uh, it wasn't the right place and it wasn't the right time for him to do this. But Peter is willing to defend Jesus. I mean, you think about this. Just earlier that night, Peter says, I'll never deny you. I'll never betray you. Now, we know he goes on to do that in just a few hours here in the trial. But in this moment, it's, it's Peter versus hundreds of soldiers. And Peter pulls out a sword and goes to doing a really bad job of swinging a, a, a sword. I don't know how you cut a guy's ear off and not really do anything else to him. Uh, but he cuts this guy Malchus's ear off. And uh, so I, I think it's worth noting that G, that uh, Peter was willing, right, to defend Jesus. He was willing to put his faith on the line. I think the other thing worth noting here, and, and we have no way of knowing this, but could you imagine being Malchus that day? So Malchus was this servant, um, uh, the servant of the high priest. So the high priest was kind of like, uh, to put that in uh, common terms today, the high priest in the first century was kind of like the pope. Uh, he uh, was the leader of the Jewish nation in terms of all spiritual things. Um, and so he was a servant to the high priest who did not like Jesus, wanted Jesus arrested. And so obviously this guy Malchus was there, not a fan of Jesus's, but actually there to see harm done to Jesus, uh, an enemy of Jesus. And so all of a sudden Malchus gets his ear cut off. Luke's gospel tells us that Jesus puts his ear back on, he mends his ear. An enemy, the guy who came to arrest Jesus. That tells us a lot about Jesus, but it also makes me wonder, what did Malchus do after that? Was Malchus the guy that handcuffed Jesus? Or did he kind of, after Jesus healed him, did Malchus kind of withdraw back into the crowd of soldiers to say, yeah, maybe I'll take a back seat to this. Maybe this Jesus guy isn't so bad. Was he appreciative of Jesus? I wonder about that. I wonder what happened to Malchus down the road. I wonder if Malchus put two and two together after the resurrection and realized who Jesus really was. I wonder if he was won over by the kindness of Jesus. So just some interesting things to think about today. I pray that that encourages your faith and your hope in who Jesus is and the power that he holds in his hands. Let's pray. God, thank you for your faithfulness to us. I thank you, God, that you are powerful, um, that there is nothing beyond the scope of your reign and your power and your sovereignty. And I pray that we, in turn, God, would be so trusting of you, that we'd recognize how good you are, we'd recognize how faithful you are, and God, that we would just, um, God, that we would stand in awe of you. Thank you for being on our side and fighting for us and being willing to do whatever it takes, God to redeem us and to save us and to give us a life of great fulfillment. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, everybody. Hope you have a good afternoon. Thanks for joining.